Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, friends. I'm so happy to welcome you to today's new book showcase, Cultivating Voices, Live Poetry. And I'm your host, Sandy Yunon, with, and I'll always have the best seat in the house for these astounding readings that we put on and have been putting on since the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020. Uh, it's an absolute thrill today to be welcoming our four poets for our new book showcase today because they've been they've been members of Cultivating Voice for quite a time and have contributed in their own unique ways. And just a little bit about Cultivating Voices Live Poetry for those of you who might be watching the recording or watching live as we're streaming on to Zoom or YouTube. We began in March of 2020 in response to all live poetry shutting down um, because of the pandemic. And over the course of these past two years, we have created a week, we had a weekly reading series and we have since moved to a format where we have three readings a month with a special event thrown in every now, for, every now and then for good measure. And today we begin always with a poet's focus on a particular theme or word actually is how we think of it. And last week's was the word hunger. And I, I wanna send a particular shout out to those of you who were able to join us and participate in reading for what was just quite an incredible of moving, moving reading. Thank you so much. Well, our second, our second Sunday is always what you're here for today, our new book showcase. And we wrap and round out our third reading of the month, always with a wild card open mic. So I hope you'll pay attention to the readings that we have on our calendars, on our sites, and join us any Sunday that you can with our many, many members that join us from all over the world. We are an intersectional, intergenerational, international reading poetry group and began here on, began on Facebook. And again, let your friends know, we love to have new members at all times. We're up to about 3,600 at this point. Uh, we begin very humbly with 300. Well, now let's move to our four fabulous readers for today. You'll be hearing from Julia Magrini, Annette Sasson, Marjorie Maddox, and Rachel Hegarty. It's like incredible to have this quartet with us today. Each will read for about 15 minutes from their new collection and maybe some new poems sprinkled in for good measure. Uh, we may get a screen share or two. And I hope that you will appreciate the poetry of these four as much as I've been in anticipation and appreciation of their work as we've um, not only just on Cultivating Voices, but uh, I was familiar with the work of some of them prior to that as well. Well, our first reader today is Giulio Magrini. And uh, Giulio has joined us many, many times here on Cultivating Voice. You are an avid, avid open micer and such a supportive person in our readings. And it, it was a joy to meet you for the very first time. I, I still have images of meeting you from the first time and, and hearing your work. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with Julia's work, you are in for quite, quite a robust experience 
and I'm very happy to be able to feature his newest collection. Well, let me read you a little bit more from the formal biography about Julia before we hear from The Color of Dirt. Julia Magrini has performed at Pittsburgh's Three Rivers Arts Festival and many other venues. He has conducted poetry workshops at alternative high schools, prisons, rehabilitation centers, and hosted a radio show. He was asked to perform his elegy to the late mayor, Richard Calugiri, the Pittsburgher, with the Pittsburgh Symphony. Magrini has always preferred performing his work over publishing until now, and I think you're going to get a flavor of that today. His collection, The Color of Dirt, is an anthology of his poetry and flash fiction. Magrini's poems remind us, as he says, we have put our hands in the dirt and sanctified each other. Would you all please welcome Julia Magrini. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much. I wanna thank everyone at Cultivating Voices and every member here for their interest in my book, The Color of Dirt. I hope you hear kinship in the work today. My first poem uh, called The Pittsburgher. Pittsburgh can be an intimate city. I wrote a memorial to the mayor of Pittsburgh, Richard Caligiri, when he died when he was 56 of amyloidosis, the poem, The Pittsburgher. Behind the glass of sky, layers of wet glisten and descend from the clouds over Lawrenceville, Morningside, and East Liberty. The morning rain tenderly coats metal rails embedded in cobblestone. Along the banks of the rivers, steel mills become fossils and a watery clacking of heels is heard on North Millvale Street. The calm is upon us. The spirit of Richard Caligiotti continues without pause in this Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The heavens of neighborhoods feel the guardian stars with tenderness and we feel it in the corners of his mouth, the light in his eyes, or as he shaved his father. Io amo questa città, Papa. I love this city, Papa. The earth grows soft tonight. Stardust coats the alleyways, rivers, and bridges. We are able to see the potential of humanity in the life of this Pittsburgher. The bells toll. Songs to the eternal fill the churches. And, and it is said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And we know. Uh, my next poem is, this is a celebration of artists as we embrace the process. And it's called Artists and the Intelligentsia. I should tell you that Pierre Lacay's cemetery is the largest cemetery in Paris where Oscar Wilde is buried on Avenue Corette. Clouds of mystery, veil, beatified innocence, sliding on a winding suppressed detour, stacked with rocks and littered glass. Our apprentices study the boundaries and decide to investigate beyond the threshold, initiate a journey to investigate this indefinable moment to illuminate and pursue the passion and work of art. On the meandering path, they behold billboards of distraction, obstructions in flashing lights and jingles. They hear the fortunate privilege, ignite the fuse of commercials, advertising the business of technique to the sponge of masses. 
but through the destiny of internal aesthetic justice, a wondrous phenomenon of disruption explodes unexpectedly and thunders in recognition by nomads lost in the wilderness and the mayhem of world. They are conducted by an artist's instrument to the gods of harmony and the explanation of humankind. The iconic slumbering artists of history decay prominently in Père Lachaise, jangle with the blade-breathing collective leftovers, subsist around mediocrity in size, outcast, peculiar, and marginalized. The craft is camouflaged by the intentionally bewildered, senseless to the possibilities of achievement and the thunderous truths of the invisible as they disintegrate and withdraw to obscurity, exalting the stars with their answers. The medium and the touchstones of civilization were defined through history as an artist's production that begets the manifestation of us. These chosen few, these artists, exploring the challenging corridors of consciousness, pursue the natural continual reflection and expression of what it is to be human. Here, the melodies of spirit recognize delight and fury in the blending of notes, tints of color, and the composition of words. In this concordant and disharmonious world, the intelligentsia huddle and execute smug impersonations, categorize au courant dilettant to the innocent and the vitiate who were not apprised of violence, and the camera is coerced in sorrow and pans to Avenue Cadet in Père Lachaise, where the lips of Oscar Wilde contort even tighter. Thank you. This, I think, resulted in my paro parochial education and that rascal Emil Zola's admonition that civilization will not attain to its perfection until the last dung from the last church falls on the last priest. It's called Better to be Born an Animal. This black responsibility in Wednesday ashes as our dirty teeth caress the body of Christ. Monks cower behind the walls of cathedrals. The Gregorian chant tranquilizes our spirits. Quasimodo strains at the ropes of Big Marie and Gabriel. We are reminded of rodents in a Skinner box as we scamper for wafer and comfort. Clouds of incense rain blessed waters on corrupted bodies covered in sores of sin. From the ramparts below the gorgons in baritone gravitas and purple vestment, the shepherd counsels the immigrants, give money to the poor in St. Francis's behalf. He will intercede before God in the night. The liturgy skulks in the shadows. There is a clanking of keys and furtive locking doors from inside the churches. If we are very quiet, we can hear Francis giggling through the incense. We can smell marijuana and hear women moan. Perhaps the English are right. True love is abuse. We, uh, thank you. We got to turn to love, don't we? Uh, Pittsburgh sits at the confluence of three rivers. There is a fountain at the point fed by an aquifer called the Fourth River. I wrote this as I stared at the enormous November flurries and fountain that night in Pittsburgh. It's called Vince to Rachel over the Fourth River in November. 
and it's for all lovers. Every time I love you, a flake of snow forms separate, distinguishable. If in these years I have surrounded you in a blizzard of love, you should know I could not help myself. I never knew I would love someone that it would begin every day and be you. I was asking people I love, what is I should do on this cultivating voices? Uh, and they said, well, read something funny. Read to, and I, so I, I picked this, and I think I read this here before. And I guess I should mention, I have a Facebook account. This is called, no, you cannot write poetry. If you carry initials after your name, you cannot write poetry. You must first figure out everyone's wokeness, achieving, achieving perfect symmetry in an environment of smug confusion. If you are wealthy, don't you dare write poetry. If you are poor, you can write it because you are powerless and no one listens. If you rhyme, you can write poetry. You will aggravate everyone. Your words, a self-fulfilling prophecy in harmonious contempt. Write poetry that is amorphous, incomprehensible, and perplexing. The vapid will be transfixed by you, and the scholarly will ignore you. Your attempt to occupy a gloomy or cheerful preoccupation in poetry are hopeless, pathetic. The harmful effects of your human derivative waste on our environment. Don't waste your time. Poetry is not your thing. It is not meant for your type of person. And what are you doing? Listening to what you think is poetry. You live in dissonance with poetry. Plans should be made. Subscriptions canceled. for anthologies and meds. For you cannot write poetry. You do not belong with those others who do not belong, for they are the poets and live in the ether. They breathe the air of the misbegotten angels needing to fly in the polluted air, speaking the language of the dead and dying. But someone has to do it, and the person who is crucified this time cannot be you, because you cannot write poetry. We have poets for that. Thank you very much. Um, I wrote this approaching retirement. It, it, I got some help with a line written by Sting. It's called, For All My Days Remaining. You, now me, offered the blessings of the dust and brick. My small hands held in yours, now holds another. To guide uncertain steps, passing the wand of strength to sticky hands that reach from below. My compass is engaged, the north star is fixed, and so am I. I and the radiant light of the universe, the unconsumed burning, not in testament, but in blood. The face of a father eliminates fear, or at least until fear is fed by time. And now I am aged, and they say I am an empty warrior. The conflicts of today do not attend to me. It is, whispered, it is whispered that I am weak and weathered, not a worthy opponent for the fear of life or the life of fear. The moments stand ready to punish me. Let us share the enlightenment. 
I travail the gloaming, leap through barricades. I emerge and break victorious through the eras of our age. I do not hear the trembling voice of weary plummet from my wits through my promenade of words marching forward. I am told these pounding waves of days debilitate and weaken the spirit through natural regressions and decay. Who are these people? And who do they pray to? I am here tonight to say I am veracity, the exemplification of protest, my conflict and victories, whet my appetite for more, my aging cause battles with nobility and develops an unshakable strength, and I will not be stopped. I supernova through time. There is no defeat in me. My heart radiates love with every beat, and for all my days remaining, I will rapture in these heavens. I will define the life I lead for all my days remaining. Thank you. Um, sometimes it's impossible to get along with society generally and specifically in a relationship. This is uh, called discovering we are extinct and it's in two parts. Discovering we are extinct generally and the remarkable aspect of time. Grotesque merges to familiar, infiltrates the caress of phantoms. Pirouettes of lunacy straddle the boulevard. Overlords march in shrouds of patrician pink to goose-step directives and pound a tempo of bureaucratic chic. I can hear them chanting in contentment while they pray over me. I chirp my schedule to the numbed associated entirety and speculate that zombies cannot explain my load or advise how to discreetly carry it as I continue to converse with flattened stone. At the very brink of deluge, I am promised anesthesia, temporary abatement from the beatings and slander. A kindred spirit promises that I am all right and whispers, I will never be alone discovering we are extinct specifically. I see my rippled image in the diluted lakes of your eyes. Where is the cleansing of salt that intermingled between us? It has occluded inside me where it preserves my vitals, crystalline and, and dormant. I become the focusing through the fog. I remember whimpering promises before the bruises and bleeding, but my congealed cadaver is displayed in disarray in a land absent of rainbows. There is no dispensation in a state populated by the dead where the only legacy is that the obsolete cannot be damaged beyond extinction. We are the undiscovered fossils beneath the steps of the living, dry, bleached, and lifeless. The memories of our bones loiter under the abiding mess, obliged that no one examines the failure of our remains. How am I doing on time? You have about, you have probably time for one more poem. Okay. Um, my last poem then will be, uh, well, my instruction to listen to this poem, it is in Italian. Uh, listen to the sounds of the Italian. And when I translate, translate it, try to remember the sounds of Italian. I would like to send this out to Sandy Yanone. Sono il vento, 
o già passato questi abiti nudi là dove sei. Hai sentito la mia canzone? Era breve. E non sempre bella, ma l'ho scritta per te. E gli abiti nudi. Quando ti trovi tra loro, non ricorda me. Pensa a me. I am the wind. I pass through these bare trees you stand among. Did you hear my song? It was brief and not always beautiful, but I wrote it for you. Bare trees, when you are among them, don't remember me. Think of me. Thank you, everybody. Grazie, grazie. Julia Magrini, a new collection is the color of dirt. And we've had the opportunity to hear a number of poems throughout the course of you publishing the book prior. And I just have to say that, you know, the lines were really ringing through me today. And um, well, so many that I kind of wrote down in my notebook and but the one I'm going to amplify is that we are the undiscovered fossils. Oh my gosh. I will never, you know, it's, it's like you hear something that you know you're never, ever going to forget. And the other thing I'd like to say is just, I truly hope that someday I get to come to Pittsburgh and actually see you perform in person uh, because I just know I you know I know I know zoom is fine and I can't even imagine how much more exquisite it will get in person so thank well, you so much. thank you Sandy but I uh, come to Pittsburgh seeing you in the audience would be wonderful however come to the table seeing you at the table is an even greater sharing, and that comes from my nonno. So. Uh, grazie, grazie. That's Giulio Magrini, The Color of Dirt. Please, friends, today, if you have the resources, we have the links to all the books here, uh, available here for our new books showcase. You know, I will, I will start to, I will start to say this now. The holidays are coming up. Poetry, what a gift. So if you're not inclined to get one for yourself, buy a book or two or many for one of your beloveds uh, for the holidays. Poetry is the best gift that I know. Uh, and I receive it every single week or almost every single week um, here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. So as I said, please do feel free um, to check out our links for the collections and they will also appear tomorrow um, on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry site. Well, just a reminder also folks, please leave your comments in the chat, respectful of course, sharing the love with everybody and you know, speaking of the joy, speaking of the joy of being in person, I do have to say that our next poet, Annette, I met first in person when we were attending Poets on the Coast, a, a writing retreat for women poets, and uh, over, you know, I can actually see us. I can see us having dinner, not at the, not at the, not at the place where you think I'm going to say the Katie's place, but I can see us having, we went out for dinner another night and we were sitting outside. And that is my initial really, really enduring memory of you because it was the first time that you had joined and you didn't know many people and it, um, and you were telling us these like amazing stories. And 
I, I can just see all our friends sitting around and kind of just welcoming you in and feeling like just feeling the joy of getting to start to know you. And so what a what a fabulous thing now, of course, that we get to celebrate the publication of your work and continue to connect through who knew, even though we would connect initially in person, that we'd continue to do it through these little screens. <laughs> So let me, without further ado, without gushing too much, uh, <laughs> share with you, the, the, share with you um, Annette's more formal biography. Annette's poems can be found in Valparaiso Poetry Review, the Birmingham Poetry Review, Rust and Moth, the Citron Review, Typishly One and Others. Her collection is Small Fish in High Branches. Do you love that title, folks? Do you love that title? Small Fish in High Branches. And it was published by Glass Liar Press, one, a, a press I truly, truly love. Just in this May of 2022. Annette was a Mark Strand Scholar for the 2021 Sewanee Writers Conference. And of course, you can learn more about her on her own individual website. Uh, and so be on the lookout, everyone in the chat for that. Annette, thank you so much for being here. I'm so glad to hear your poems today. Well, I am thrilled and honored to be here. And Sandy, I remember that dinner clearly because that was the point at which I began to feel like I might belong. I had to have no recollection of telling any stories, but I remember your warmth and I remember feeling like, yeah, these could be my people for sure. Um, I wanna thank Sandy and Kim and Don uh, for helping me get here and facilitating everything. I, I wanna just show you a copy of my book, Small Fish in High Branches. Um, it did come out in May. And I'll be reading from it, and I'm going to begin with the title poem so you understand where I got the title. It's called To See Small Fish in High Branches. My eyeballs curvature feathers the forest. I choose precision binoculars, barium glass, crisping texture and edge. This crystal amplifies the air's flux of lumens gathers them up like stray contours and plumes. A bird forms in bouquets of light. Without prisms, I see hawks circle a blue afternoon, their tails ablaze. A yellow mauve iris, the veins of its beard geometric etching on sepal. The fluttering hem of a cloudy lake, the startling girth of a heron's nest lofted in sycamore. The heron nestlings call for glass, its mesmeric gaze. To pierce the sky, to see the heads bob, the parents' talons, their powder down, the blue-gray vigil as they tend the glossy chicks, nebs and tongues and glints of small fish in high branches. So I actually saw that. We live uh, very near a nature preserve called Radnor Lake, and we go there to walk often. And um, so that was one experience there. And the next poem um, was also born, I suppose, at Radnor Lake. This poem is called Surface Tension. Water striders walk on fluid skin, feet faintly bending surface, push back propelling them forward. Their pads press visible dents into the lake's glaze, ingrained on the retina's membrane. This is not a miracle. Still, if humans walked on water, would we ever opt to swim? And if we scurried barefoot across the liquid rind, molecules clumping before each footfall, 
Would we at the lake's deep center think our questions answered? Would bullfrogs replace the call to mystery? Would brain lose its skill for beyond? Eyes cease to measure depth? Or even see a strider's surface imprint as it skims for the slightest might, as brief, as tense as an inkling? The next poem I'd like to read is a love poem. Actually, I'm going to read two love poems. <clears throat> this one is an homage to Jack Gilbert's poem, Married, uh, which is an act of hubris, I think, to even mention Jack Gilbert um, as if my poem could match it. But, you know, I'm inspired by him. This is called Near Piccadilly, and it's a sonnet. First Christmas, 26 years ago, time tumbled ahead of us. One day after, I boarded a plane for London without you. Snow piled along glittering streets. Wind blistered my eyes. The Thames blustered, hushed by edgings of ice. And every hour, my body missing its rib cage, heart valves slipping. I scoured the city for relief. Traffic flooded the street, surged from the wrong direction. I stood on a curb near Piccadilly Circus, straining to cross, to gather myself, salvage the lost body parts. Raw, blasted by river and gust, hobbled by a cold ocean, riven by want. This love uh, song or love poem uh, is called Figure of Song, and it's, it's a little happier. A high wire finch plots his tones, a five point graph. Orion migrates its turn, a refrain, figure of song. If wind were silent, would my tumbling hair, the shuddering lid against my pupil, disquiet you? Night sky points in every direction, paths of rhythms, soundless intervals, vibrations like chords, a chaos of maps. You are the hastening air, raucous in my ear, a bird song's inflection of stars. So shifting from uh, a love poem, um, this is a COVID poem. This is what COVID felt like to me. I wrote many COVID poems. They were all terrible. This is the only one worth reading. <laughs> Metal and glass. In the milky glass of sleep, you dream of leading students on a field trip to a place you have no earthly idea how to find. The memory's metal barbs scrape the delicate skin of morning. What I want to tell you is as upright and true as the white cosmos in the front garden. Their feathered stalks lean into October wind, rain coating the veins of blooms, a thin platinum sheen. Hear me. No one ever knows anything for sure. Every single thing you've learned is your car teetering on a mountain two lane, no shoulder, a flatbed barreling toward you, targeting the windshield's glare. Um, the next poem I'd like to read um, is written uh, in memory of my first father-in-law. Um, he was he lived his whole life in Boise, Idaho, and um, <clears throat> it's called Prodigal Father. He stopped at every dam from Boise to Spokane, curved through two lines of rock and two lanes of rock. I'm going to start over. He stopped at every dam from Boise to Spokane, curved through two lanes of rock and scorched dirt. Spirit Lake, 
Nine Mile, Grand Coulee, Upriver, the rugged feats of Big Sky and Great West. He downed 32 ounce beers, reeled into gas stations for more, wrangled his wife, sparring over the churns, the fastest route to the next dam. Still, his voice sweetened as he stared at each new edifice, rehashing design, construction, the segment of river, its history, bed, channels, how its topography must be taken to account. Two, his kindness. When he spoke of the sun in Spokane, a halfway house, a judge's grace. Understand his story, his sorrow, a good boy. Such pressure, it's all about scaffolding. This father, his sons, his beer and smokes, acres of roiling lake, restrained like the one he girded up, held in with deep footings, story, pylons of grit, his life a tender architecture of need. That day we spotted a stray runnel at the Coeur d'Alene. It slid down the prodigious barrier, darkening the rifts of baked red clay. Not a burst of rolling force, but a swill, a soft breach. <clears throat> the next poem I'd like to read, um, and I think this is the last one from the book, and then I'm going to read a couple from my new manuscript. Um, this is called Postcard from the Mother Ghost. I wrote it in response to a prompt during Poets on the Coast, where I met Sandy. Um, and uh, I was imagining myself and my children. Postcard from the Mother Ghost. Hammer yourself a ladder, lean it against the familiar, and climb like deep-rooted squash vines through daylight and blue-white heat. Rise into twilight, its pockets emptied of fireflies. Do not worry that you'll vanish, that you're alone. Let the ladder lift you beyond the heavy face of night. Turn the postcard over. See the peonies I've brushed into bloom, how they curve like hands. In the pale life that comes, there is no climbing, only the heart's circulation of time and desire. Only a sweep of words, sheen of petal and leaf, the way dandelion fuzz ascends, the way it doubles back like prayer. <clears throat> so um, I have a new book manuscript that I've just started sending out and it's called Winter Sharp with Apples. And the last three poems I'll read are from that manuscript. This poem, um, I just found out yesterday, was nominated for a pushcart uh, by the Inflectionist Review. And this is my first pushcart nomination ever. So I was pretty tickled. Um, <clears throat> it's called Death is Not. And the title is the part of the first line. Death, <clears throat> excuse me, death is not the hoot owl, stiff in quiet grass, the cat vanished outside the sliding glass, a father, spine compressed, coffin six inches too long, the doe plucked away by a coven of vultures, children, their years spooled tight, wasted, the wood roach murdered with impunity, Stakes, snakes, no more skins to shed, a mother, casket draped with the comforter she stitched, even buzzards. Where do they go? Bodies, residue, merge with soil, molecules break into earthworm, grass, tree. What of their glistening threads, the heave of their leaving? No wisp of fur in its curved beak, 
Death is not a barred owl on the forest floor, still beside a shag bark. <clears throat> the next poem, um, my mother died in January of 2018, and uh, I'm still writing poems about her. I guess I always will. This poem is called Her Offering. I planted cantaloupe in my front yard last spring, a sweet ground cover, annual among perennials. One by one, before they could ripen, their skins split, coral flush gaping. I suspected raccoon, possum, deer, the heat, not the eastern box turtle plodding through shadowed vines, snug under its stenciled carapace, saffron eyed among chiseled rinds, spilled seeds, the raw viscera of loss. Three years before, my mother proffered a list of marriage partners for my father, for after she passed. The roll call of candidates carried on, my mother then too frail to deliver her lines. I preserved the spectacle of my silence, never performed her part, even as she made her bow. Today in this garden, honeyed with carnage, I see my mother's kindness, how she offered herself, excuse me, the fruit of her overripe body, untangled the withering vine of her illness. I'm so sorry. Untangled the withering vine of her illness, fashioned him a sequel. <laughs> a shell like a shield etched with widow's names. Perhaps she hoped one would slip the cover off, crack open the hull of him, gather in the scattered kernels, salvage a cantaloupe roughly inscribed before summer's end. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I had one more poem, but I'm going to stop. And I'm not crying about that poem. I just have a terrible tickle. It's Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, everybody. Annette, Sasan. Thank you, Annette. Oh my gosh. Get a drink of water. All is well. All is well. All is well. I wanted to just say. Um, and if you, you know, if you need to go off camera, that's fine. Like, whatever. It's okay. <laughs> um, well, first of all, everybody, the collection is small fish in high branches. And what I really appreciated about hearing the poems is that, you know, the poet, the poet that could imagine seeing small fish in high branches, right? Like, which means it's 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 a person who is always looking for the detail in things. And that is so what I really, really marvel at and what because it's 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 not how I see the world is all the ways the detail and the precision in which you see like things in the in kind of what we'll call the natural world. Like I I just really, <laughs> really I love being brought to the peonies and I love seeing the owl and and um and of course that line about the small small fish and high branches again something something that is gonna live with me forever. Thank you again so much. And we look forward to the next collection and congratulations on the push cart. Well, folks, again, um, I, I love these new book showcases. I just have to say, like, I, I really do enjoy the, I really do enjoy the 
the way we combine poets and it's just so interesting when you get to hear poets in um, connection with each other that that would not that would not always happen and 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 to kind of see what happens i have been uh, uh, well all i'll say is marjorie maddox wrote to me too long ago and was inquiring about a reading and i was like yeah of course of course of course of course and just the way things move around in the world. It, it, it's taken until today. Um, and, but the thing is, is that when I, have, when I have heard Marjorie's poems prior to this, prior to today, I have always been thinking like, oh my gosh, I cannot wait for the day when we finally have her read from read on the program like a full set and today is that glorious day that it's finally happening and um uh there is going to be no one in the room more overjoyed by this occurrence than me than me i'm just declaring it right now okay <laughs> You can all try, but it's me. I'm the person most excited about this reading. <laughs> so let me read a little bit more from the formal biography. Marjorie Maddox is a professor of English at Lock Haven University and has published 13 collections of poetry. I said that correctly, 13 folks, including Transplant, transport, transubstantiation from yellow, which won the Yellow Glen Prize. Begin with a question, which received an international book award. Heart Speaks is spoken for, an ekphrastic collection and collaboration with the photographer Karen Elias. What she was saying, stories, and of course, a number of other collections. Today, we get to hear from the forthcoming collection um, and it in the Museum of My Daughter's Mind, based on her daughter's paintings, which is forthcoming from Shanti Arts in 2023. Again, it is with my Greatest pleasure and delight to introduce to you Marjorie Maddox, who really needs no introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandy. I'm going to disagree with you. I'm the most excited one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and thank you also, uh, Kim and Don. Um, I'm actually going to read from two books that came out in March, and um, maybe later I can uh, another day I can read from the forthcoming one with my daughter I'm, I'm yeah ready. I meant to say that the yeah we're actually hearing that's my error we meant to say we're hearing from the new books not the forthcoming one per se but if there's time a little preview <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to also um share my screen I I had two books come out in March um one one day between them, which I, I didn't plan it that way, but because of COVID things got delayed. And um, so I wanted to show you um, some slides to go with this because the first one is this acrastic collaboration with um, the amazing photographer, Karen Elias. And Karen took this heart crack shaped stone that she found on a beach in Maine and just placed it in different locations. And sometimes she wrote the, she did, took the photograph first and I wrote a poem in response. And sometimes um, I I uh, wrote the, did I say that incorrectly now? And uh, we switched back and forth is what I'm trying to say. So um, we first got paired up at a small art museum in Lock Haven where I teach. And she was given this poem of mine and created this amazing um, graphic off of it. Um, a little bit of background information. Um, my father had his first heart attack when he was 38. He lived until the age of 65. 
Um, he received his heart during the blizzard of 93, and those of you on the East Coast will remember that. Um, I had just been out to visit my family in Ohio. I live in Pennsylvania. I heard news of the, the blizzard coming. I rushed back home. A man died in a car accident, um, and I couldn't get back. He, he died in a car accident. My father got his heart, and I couldn't get back to Ohio because uh, all the roads were completely shut down. And so you can see this amazing image that Karen has created with the map of Ohio in the background and kind of um, this cracked, um, icy looking heart and then the icy looking roads. So this is the poem. Treacherous driving, it's as safe as traveling to work, a cardiologist before performing a transplant. The first night of the blizzard, that stranger inched into Ohio. Halfway through, he skidded into our snow-spackled lives. His heart is buried in my father, who is buried. This is the hole in the stranger, in my father, in my own cracked chest. Hail cupped in its cavity, the orta beginning to freeze. All winter, the weather preaches white lies, fields blank of roads, a curve straightened, the even light of sky. Tonight, the breeze is all icicles, banner-like from the clouds. Nothing is movable in this treacherous state. Our wheels spin their rhythm, a breath that pulls us, then stalls. The law of the body, of the state cannot replace the chain reaction, jackknives lives, hope piling into hope. The man in his heart, cold on an icy road, warmed us for weeks, while winter, a clear blue thing, wafted light. And I still think of, um, you know, this stranger's heart being buried inside of my father. And I'm just going to flip through and show you some of these other images of Karen's because I just think they're amazing. Um, and you can see how it was so easy to be inspired by her work. And, um, you know, and, and again, we kind of went back and forth. Um, and I'll read this next one. I need to get some of the people out of the way <laughs> so I can see the poem. So I was reading this um, article on CNN about... Um, how oftentimes donors, uh, recipients of, of, of hearts and livers, et cetera, take on the characteristics of the person who donated them. So musical taste, food preferences, personality traits. And this is the cover of the book. Um, you can see also here. Transplanted. Though they'd never met, the man with the dead man's heart inside him dreamed his donor's face, limbs, lungs, sung in his sleep the dead man's favorite song in the deep baritone voice that wasn't his own but his, the one not known or seen or heard, except in night's deep cradle of sleep, this stranger's metronome of a heart humming behind ribs that no longer felt like his, beautiful fence for an organ lifted from someone else's afterlife. Even waking the new old man and his heart now know nothing of old boundaries, the ones composed by the living. Instead, in bright silent daylight, he takes his first tentative beat toward love. Let me just this to flip and then here's some more very kind of ghostly images and this one is about domestic abuse chopping block and uh this one also is about my father's transplant heart in a box is uh the name for um a mode of transporting these hearts but more importantly it's about black lives matter and again i just need to move something so i can see the words okay Heart in a box. No picnic cooler look alike, the kind transporting a dead man's heart to my father in 93, after his 30 years of near death, when the blizzard driving, really dead anonymous donor said yes to a life not his. 
No, today's latest medical advance keeps the dead's bloody valentine pumming all the way to the sterile, stretched out on the table, almost corpse, knocked out while the crying bystanders pray for mercy, for miracles. And outside, in the real bloody world of Baton Rouge, Falcon Heights, Dallas, my town, yours, no heart p -p pums in Alton, Philandro, Lorne, Michael, Brent, Patrick, Michael, J. while waiting bystanders pray for advances and miracles. And no heart p -p pums in the dead silence of the dug up ground where they'll be transplanted bloody organs in another box because some said no to a life not theirs, while others, between the beats and the beatings, the rat-a-tat-tats and the pa-pum-pa-pum-pa-pums, tried to say yes. And Karen's uh, image here is called Remember Me. And here's a memorial for George Floyd in black and white. And I'll read this one um, about the pandemic. I was struck by this this image, um, these are such uh, artistic photographs, composite photographs. And here, as you can see, she put these two cracked hearts in separate windows. But it, to me, it also spoke about how um, we were so isolated and still sometimes continue to be isolated through um, the after effects of the pandemic and during the pandemic. But there was also a sense of bonding um, and going through similar experiences together. Quarantine. Apart inside, together they stare not at each other, but at the worn world beyond arm's reach. There, the child alone hopscotching away her worries. And there, the single blue jay dotting the drab day with color. What is no more and what is still keeps moving through the familiar view. Remember one laughs or sighs turning again toward the other, together, inside. And then just see some of these other images. Karen also is an environmental activist, so there were a, a lot of images where we talked about climate change and um, the environment. The second book, which came out uh, the next day, March 22nd, um, is called Begin with a Question, a very different kind of book um, that really deals with the problem of suffering in the world, but is not without hope. And um, so I wanted to read this poem. I was thinking about uh, Michelangelo's uh, Pieta, where Mary is holding the, the, the dead Christ. And then I started thinking about all the people who have lost a child. And one of the things that I, I love about poetry is its ability to help us to empathize with others, uh, for them to understand maybe what we've gone through, but also for, for us to be able to understand maybe something that they've gone through. Then I started thinking about Eve and Eve who had lost not only her son, but had lost her son because he was murdered by his brother. Pre Pieta. Long before Golgotha, it's just this one mother collapsed, just Eve, weeping in Cain's rocky field, haggard, alone, except for the body she cradles limp in her grieving arms. It's worse than Eden, repeated. She chose the tree, passed the seed of her will to the babe who cooed and grew into the man, aiming this rock at his brother, this bloody rock she cannot touch. No sacrificial lamb, but flesh of her flesh, her youngest, her meadow boy, here across her lap. And now his sheep have found them, bunching up without their able, in this cursed field crowding in, she fears them, she loves them, their thick wool rushing against her shoulder, her weeping, their bleeding. And um, as many of you may know, the January 6th storming of the Capitol also occurred on the Feast of Epiphany. And as around the election, I was uh, right before the election, I was walking around the neighborhood. And I imagine many of you experienced this too. I was 
often surprised where I saw certain flags and banners, uh, places I wasn't expecting them. And so I started thinking about um, how often we rub shoulders with people who have such extremely different views than we do, and we don't always know it. Um, and sometimes they're in the family as well. Um, and this is a sonnet, Epiphany. And so they rush the steps and bash the doors. With windows smashed, the winter light breaks in. Forgotten is the frankincense, the myrrh, the gold the wise men brought. Instead, our kin or neighbors storm the halls. We recognize their faces tense with hate. In different form, they look a bit like us. Yet we surmise this mob that waves its flag together swarms toward house or senate, cannot live so near. We say hello on walks, they guard our homes. This is the hard epiphany we fear. The ones we loathe and love might be the same. And that bright star, we find the manger bare, except for all our anger swaddled there. And for me, um, one of the hardest things during the pandemic was being uh, separated from my mother um, who um, moved after my father died, moved from Ohio to uh, Phoenix, well, quite a, quite a ways, quite a time afterwards, uh, 20, 20, 30 years afterwards to be with my sister in uh, Phoenix um, and she was on lockdown for quite a while, but we would talk on the phone every day. During my daily phone call to her assisted living facility, my mother explains that she is slowly fading away. And it is not the light, but the dust in the light that rises, plunges, plateaus on the short of my exhale, less final than a sigh that dies from hopelessness but still there, heavy, scattered, near dusk, and it peppers voice in the O oh of the weighty unseen, voice unraveling the feared, the obvious. And it is not the distance between words, between parent-child, not the desert under the plain, or the plain cruising above and past the jagged mountains, the wholesome prairies, the vast expanse of flat nothing I've come to expect from questions, those dust-to-dust -dust queries that filter, block, blind, restrict, restrain. Not the miles, but those same damn particles that rise, plunge, plateau on the long of my exhale that now wraps the plane, the air, the distance, not in dust, but this inhale of what could or could not be transmitted from the state of my loved ones here in the fear where we cower together, 2,000 miles cross country to her, love on lockdown, vulnerability, the only transportation, and the law and what we can and cannot speak. All the while my mother and I stay where we are, the dust still swirls, she still breathes on the other end of the line. I am slowly fading away, she states again, matter of factly, voice so slight, it unravels me. Nowhere to go but here, daily rerun of routine, ear to a phone, listening, dust in light rising, exhale, inhale, a life, <sighs> multiplied or halved. I am slowly fading away. I state again, matter-of-factly, my voice so slight, it unravels her. And I'll end on a more uplifting poem. Um, I love blueberries. And uh, last summer, I got to teach a uh, poetry workshop or a poetry retreat that was housed at a uh, at a convent type of uh, facility and they grew blueberries picking blueberries at the convent split berries bruised berries plump berries yellow not yet ripe berries maroon almost their berries given to temptation berries scattered sublime berries oozing past prime berries hidden below berries nowhere to go berries over your head berries, all beads of prayer berries, 
in the bramble of branches, the tangle of twigs, beyond scratch and stain, the sweet shrub blooms, its small fruit destined for discard, dirt, dessert, or divine intervention, delicious rote of rosary. And thank you very much. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Well, you exceeded my expectations. <laughs> and they were very, 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 very high to begin with. <laughs> what an incredible, what an incredible reading. That's that sonnet. I mean, every single poem. You know had its own glory to it, its own glory and mystery and power. All, there's not many poems that I can say that can hold all three of those things at the same time, but I felt that in every single one of your poems, that triumvirate of glory, mystery, and power. Oh my gosh. Folks, well, of course, now we'll be, we're waiting now eagerly for in the museum of my daughter's mind. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you in the new book showcase for that. But we've just heard the poems from Marjorie Maddox from Heart Speaks is spoken for. And begin with a question the two latest books by Marjorie Maddox. And um, thank you. Thank you incredibly for the reading today. It brought up many, many things. Um, many, many things, many questions and answers for me. Oh my gosh. Well, uh, we go from that to, again, another, uh, you know, another poet that just honestly has taken me so, so many places. Um, I remember buying Rachel Hegarty's book, May Day, 1974. I remember the day I first saw it picked it up, bought it, and then proceeded to not have it away for it, have it by my side for like for for over two years. Like it was like in my possession every single day for over two years. I was at the Salmon Poetry Bookshop. I turned around and there was the book. And I've, and then I was like, I, I just could not, I could not, I could not get over the book. I could, I, and I never will. I never will. Of course, if you were with us um, in 2021, you heard Rachel read from, you heard Rachel, uh, excuse me, in 2020, you heard Rachel read from May Day, 1970 for and it is always always an amazing experience to be in Rachel's presence and to hear her remarkable voice uh the your the poetry is in amazing contrast to an incredible humor that you that you have about you and i just love your spirit and being and um, uh, I can't wait to meet you in person someday. I hope it happens. That's all I'll say. <laughs> I mean, that's not all I'll say. I'm going to read your, I'm going to share your biography with folks. Uh, you know, a few years ago, we had our poets, we had our, um, we had our Laureate Love Fest. And all I could say is, well, well, your dear friend, 
Catherine A. Cohen read, was one of the poet laureates that read with us that day. And I'm very happy to say that since that time, Rachel now has, um, has also become a poet laureate. So Rachel Hegarty is the poet laureate for Dublin One, a Dubliner born and bred. She was educated by the Holy Faithers in Finglas, the UMass Bostonians, the Trinity and Fillers in Dublin, and her, the PhD magicians at Queen's University, Belfast. Her day view collection, Flight Paths Over Finglas, won the 2018 Shine Strong Award, um, which if you're not familiar with this, an, a very prestigious award um, in Ireland. A child survivor, of the Talbot Street bomb, her collection, May Day 1974 from Salmon in 2019, received much critical acclaim. Far better acclaim than I gave it today, but mine is very, very high. It is very, very high, but it's received much better acclaim than what I've given it today. Well, we now are so fortunate that we have this beautiful third collection, Dancing with Memory from Salmon. It is a dance hall of memory for her mother who lives with Alzheimer's. Rachel teaches at the Trinity Access Program. And I always love that she adds this to her bio. Uh, Rachel's kids say she uses the three F words too much. Tengles, feminism, and feckin' poetry. Would you please join me in welcoming Rachel Haggerty. Thank you very much, Kim. Hello, everybody. Big greetings from Ireland to everybody in America. We hope you're doing well. Uh, things are looking up in America. We're all very happy this side of the world. Uh, so well done, lads. Um, so thank you very much, Sandy and Kim and to Don for setting up Cult by Voices. It's a great platform to uh, get poems out there. Poems are medicine and medicines are poems. So it's great. And it's a really great honor to be able to read with Julio, Annette and Marjorie. I was sitting there uh, just swimming in words, pure delighted with myself and then thinking, fuck it, I have to read. <laughs> And so I had to do a really sprint swim back to the shore of my own poems. Um, so thank you very much, Julia and Annette and Marjorie. That was pure medicine. Um, so this is me, Ma. And uh, we sadly lost her last September to Alzheimer's. Uh, she carried me and now I carry her. Um, so when she turned 80, uh, two things happened. One, I lost the memory key uh, with me first manuscript on it. And I was wandering around my home house and fingers going, I'm actually losing my memory key. And my mother was like, there's a key for memory. And I was like, well, it's a little gizmo mat that you put in the computer and all the stuff is on it. And I should have known by then that there was something up. And uh, she said, sure, I don't need any memory keys. You're a poet and you can be my memory. Um, so later that day, we had a big family party. It was great fun. And I asked me, Ma, like, well, Ma, 80 years old, how are you feeling? And she's like, good now. It's been a good life. It's been a happy life. 10 children, 19 grandchildren, three great grandchildren. It's good. But if I had me time over, I'd be a dancer. <laughs> what? And I knew she loved dancing. And I was like, all right, Ma. But unfortunately, within a few months of her 80th birthday, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So she made me promise to write a memory poem for her. And we did. Uh, there's a poem in this book for every year of her life. Um, and we'd play music, we'd dance, and then I'd write a poem. And that's where these poems come from. Swing, 1939. And somehow Duke Ellington made it out of Harlem and right back here to Dublin. 
Don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. And Boogie Woogie blared from the dance halls. Your aunts got in on the action, learned how to leapfrog over hunkered fellows' heads and spin a man back up just to slide through his bowed legs. Bodies were jazzy playgrounds. Until the night before England vowed war. Radio Aaron aired Chamberlain's speech. Your nan and granddad hunched by the wireless. Neighbours came in and didn't even knock. It was September, the end of summer, and your Auntie Kathleen never danced swing again. Um, so in Ireland, we speak two languages. We have the language we are all like to speak when we're drunk or having fun in bed or roaring and shouting. And then we have our stepmother's language, which is English. Um, but we have these places called the Gale Talks. And during the summer, kids will go off to the Gale Talks and have the crack. Um, but it's expensive. But my mother won a little uh, scholarship from my grandfather's stonemasons trade union to go to the Gale Talk. Um, and it's about a Cayley. And a Cayley is where we all dance together, Irish dancing style. It can be very wild. Connemara Cayley, 1949. The Gael Tuck Prize from the Brickies Union made your granddad so proud of me. He yupped. I went to Galway with your godmother. Our first time to be let out of Dublin. The train chugged west made us pure giddy. Connemara was all mountains, lakes, stone walls, a big sky and lovely woolly sheep. I love the days spent in the old language and the nights dancing in the hollow moor. Rows of eight girls facing rows of eight boys, stepping out, stepping in, shy face to face, letting on not to flirt like bold things. Clasping hands for some wild, Dizzying spins, felt the charge of teenage skin on skin. Um, most of the poems in this collection are sonnets. Uh, I wanted to go back to that Latin sonatina, little song, and have a little song for each year of me mad life. So as I said before, um, my ma had 10 kids. I'm seventh. Uh, but I didn't realize how much dance was part of uh, the making of those children until we started making this book together. And um, my mom also had brothers and sisters who emigrated to London in the 50s to get jobs and they'd come home once a year. It takes two, 1961. Your Auntie Eileen used to come back home once a year with wild stories from London. The way she told it, the place was dance hall after dance hall. Mods, rockers, teddy boys and rockabilly girls as bold as you like. In Brixton, the Latin folks had dances that would make the parish priest bless himself. Eileen taught me and your dad to tango. Left foot forward, sidestep, sidestep, open. Back step for two, cross feet, pause for balance, pivot, legs trace out a figure of eight, relax, let your right leg float over his, trail your leg back, move slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, lower the knees and press into the arms, keep bodies open to one another. Any wonder I fell pregnant again? There you have it. Irish contraception, how are you? The Bump, 1978. Dance helped me stay sober. 
like take the bump. Bums bashing together. Your da was chuffed. So were you kids. Do the bump. Do the bump. The boys saw it as a disco with tackles. Your sisters used it as a chance to floor. They weren't alone. The community do at the blacker. I'd never seen the likes. Lady bump and give up the funk was right. Men and women, couples married for years, went wild. Side by side, jump, hands up and clap, swing hips and clash bumps, bump all around you until you bump back to your darling. She's great. Uh, one of the great joys of uh, my kids' lives was being with their granny and her 19 grandchildren and her three great grandchildren thought the sun, moon and stars shone out of me ma's arse. And I think my dad did too. <laughs> but um, she also had a, a very interesting crowd of friends uh, who lived very interesting lives. And some of them were very Marxist in their approach to property in shops. I hope you like Madonna. Confessions on a Dance Floor, 2006. One young lad from the fellowship got me Madonna's CD. Yeah, it was stolen. But we cleaved off the security tag with a skewer and the wedge end of a knife. The disc clicked with a deck in the kitchen. Sounds came out, a disco beat, a tick talk rhythm made me get off the chair and start to sway me hips shimmy shoulders and use the cooker as a still but strong partner me hands jived in the air and the grandkids took to shift the deal tables and chair made a bigger dance space for us to dance out of a rainy summer's afternoon in Finglas. One child rocked and spun a chair on one leg. Another crooned into a wooden spoon. I boogied me old bones and felt young again. Um, so yeah, even though Mad got the diagnosis in 2018 of Alzheimer's, in retrospect, there were signs on that for probably five or six years that things weren't, weren't doing well. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that happens with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia is really familiar words seem to just fall out of your ear and they never come back again. And uh, that happened with Ma. Trouble with language. Ma takes us to see the thingy bob's nest, shows us their hidden place in the rushes. The kids race, me and Ma link arms, breathe, rest. Her grandsons wheel twig daggers for this quest, down a fingless path so green and luscious. Ma takes us to see the thingy bob's nest. She points at the swans, the birds she loves best. Watch me call them birds in the bushes. The kids race. Me and Ma link arms, breathe, rest. This day will end with the sun in the west. Water gurgles over stones. Talca gushes. Ma takes us to see the thingy bob's nest. We talk family, local gossip and jest. We walk further. An April breeze hushes the kids race. Me and Ma link arms, breathe, rest. I clock her last words, shrug. I don't want her stressed. We make time for the swans and song thrushes. Ma takes us to see the thingy bob's nest. The kids race. Me and Ma link arms, breathe rest. Uh, so you might have guessed the last section of the book is in Villanelle's 
um, because uh, my ma's form of dementia, she did repeat herself an awful lot. Um, so uh, I was lucky enough in some ways to be around the corner from me ma's nursing home. So I could go up every day and uh, talk to her up on a fourth floor window and waving and uh, bring her uh, food packages and leave them in the sliding door. Um, it was hard, but at least I could see her and she could kind of see me. But I do remember that first day of the lockdown and going up to me Maz and not being able to get into her. And uh, I will confess my first thought was I'm going to bomb the place. <laughs> but I didn't. Anyhow, lockdown 2020. They locked down all the nursing homes today. The sign says COVID-19, no access. Ma, please, please tell me it won't end this way. My legs buckle and begin to fray. Even though I've just bought you a new spring dress, they locked down all the nursing homes today. Our nightly visits, I'm not allowed to stay. Who's going to do your cold cream? Can't guess. Ma, please, please, please tell me it won't end this way. Without your night night hug, me heart's astray. I can only imagine your distress. They locked down all the nursing homes today. From Sydney Harbour to Dublin Bay, the world's become one viral global mess. Ma, please, please tell me it won't end this way. Go to sleep. Dream of dance. We'll be okay. Ma, I swear to good Jesus, I'll get access. They locked down all the nursing homes today. Listen, Ma, I won't let it end this way. You'd be glad to know I got in. <laughs> um. Yeah, the last poem that I'm going to read is um, the last poem in the book, and it, it is back to a sonnet because my ma was so much more than her dementia. And uh, it's my ma's idea of heaven. And I'll read this for all of you out there who made it through COVID and particularly for anybody who might have had to have buried somebody in these COVID times. But I'll read this for all of us. No last dance. You're not to be worrying. Your da was right. Heaven is one lovely, mighty sing song. You can't carry a tune. Just dance along. I dance with me last son, my angel bright. Your da belts out his best ballads and airs. He gives a great lash of the rocky road and Luke Kelly helps him carry the load me and the baby dance away our cares ah now stop with the tears let go of grief you know I'm back to myself and dancing your dad's singing and we're still romancing no sickness here just the sow of release recall with joy my long and wondrous life. Now let me dance me way into the long, long night. Thank you very much. Oh, it's just beautiful. Oh, everyone, that's Rachel Hegarty. The book is Dancing with Memory from Salmon Poetry 2021. And um, what, a what a thing to have the relationship with your mother, the vision to create the collection that danced through her life. 
that created your collective dance and that now, you know, her desire to never sort of be forgotten is now every time you read it, you know, her life, your life, your family's life is now part of the dance that we all do, that we all do. And um, I just think it's exquisite. I just think it's exquisite. And everyone here, I'm sure will never forget that they, that they were here today to hear your poems, as well as the poems of our other readers today. I had an incredible, as I said, folks, I, I felt the special energy of today with this quartet and uh, y'all did not disappoint. So please, um, in a moment, if would you unmute to show your deepest, deepest appreciation for the poetry that we that 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 we heard today from Julia Magrini, Annette Sasson, Marjorie Maddox, and Rachel Hegarty. Like, oh my god, I'm 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 taken. I'm 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 just absolutely taken with today's reading. And uh, feel free to unmute and show your appreciation. Hey. Thank you. Thank Absolutely you. stunning. Bravo. Wow. Bravo. The doves. Bravo. The doves. Oh, wow. It's really uh wonderful. Well, we did it again folks and uh, again i want to remind you uh you know those of you that are here in the zoom room you have a different kind of experience because you are in community with others listening in real time um i'm so appreciative for the recordings but it's a very different kind of experience to uh, to be hearing it as it's happening, um, as it's as it's lived, and I'm grateful for our audience today to be able to share the experience um, with me, and for us to share the experience with each other. I do hope that you, if you have the resources, that you will, of course, consider purchasing one or all of the books that we heard from today um it was it was quite an incredible offering of poetry well everyone that's our new book showcase and next week we gather back together again for our wild card open mic and uh i'm going to leave you wanting just a little bit when I say that I'll be reading from on, I'll be joining you from on location. And we'll leave that as a little bit of a surprise, but you won't want to miss the surprise of next week's reading, the wild card open mic, if you care to join us and be one of our um, 12 featured poets, please join us a quarter till the, start hour, which uh, where I will be, will be, uh, join us at 2.45 Eastern time for sign up. Um, again, join us for the, at the quarter hour. We get the signups happen quite quickly. We will have a waiting list, but uh, five minutes apiece for our featured readers in the open mic. The, it's the week that will be the week, the weekend before here in the States, the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, so I will look forward to being in community with everyone next Sunday. I also wanna give a little bit of a shout out. There's a great reading happening a little later on today. At, uh, it's gonna be at uh, 4 p.m. Pacific and that's 7 p.m. Eastern and uh, uh, we get to hear Kim Ports Parsons read along with uh, 
Uh, Susanna Case will be also joining. This is the West East Coast by uh, Poets of the Pandemic, uh, by coastal po by, by coastal poets of the pandemic, and uh, I hope you'll be able to join us for that double header. Uh, I'll get to introduce Kim and get to hear some amazing poems from the May Apple Forest. Well, again. Um, I am so grateful for our our poets that joined us today, and uh, honestly, I can't wait for the next time I get to hear to hear the four of you. And I might just have to make it be in the same combination again because I I loved the I loved the way that you all um, moved with your themes and poetry together. Uh, again, I do hope, folks, that you will cons you know, that you will uh, consider Julio's The Color um, the color of Dirt, Annette's a small, small fish in high branches. Marjorie Maddox, what amazing imagery, particularly that we saw because of the ekphrastic nature of Heart Speaks is spoken for, and we also heard from Begin with a question. And then finally, uh, such a moving dance, a true dance, a true dance, a book of poetry that is a dance itself. Rachel, Rachel Haggerty's Dancing with Memory. Please do, folks. Find a way to add these to your collection or to the collection of your beloveds and join us next week for more poetry where we will uh, get to dance and listen and 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 be with each other and as I say at every at every the ending of every reading that we've been doing since March of 2020 you know take good care of yourselves this week and always Take very good care of your beloveds. And look what happens when you write your miraculous poetry. Keep doing it. Keep doing it this week. And we'll hear those poems hopefully next week. This is Sandy Adon you know, for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry with immense gratitude and thanks again to our audience here in Zoom, our audience watching on Facebook, those of you watching the recording, and of course, to Kim Ports Parsons, Don Krieger, this would not happen without them ever. And again, to our, our poets who always show up with all the humanity and open the world to us. What a, what a day, what a day. We'll see you next time. Phew.